Is that you, Steve? Yes, it is. How are you doing, my friend? Good. How are you, man? Excellent. We are the locker room in uh, Edmonton, Canada on 95.7 Cruise FM. I'm Lachlan. We've got uh, Jimmy and Grant with me as well. Hello. So. Hello. Great. Thank Thanks, you. Fellas. Thank you for this, by the way. Yeah, thank you. We were promoting your uh, your new book. When did the book come out, Steve? Came out at the end of September. Okay. I... And uh, this is the first. You're the first. Uh, I'm just now starting to promote in Canada, and you're, in fact, my first interview. So. There we go. Get out of here. The really? Book, Hard to handle? So the life and death of the Black worse, Rose? My first Canadian uh my first Canadian interview for the book. <laughs> All right, that's awesome. I did not know that. That's very cool. Um, I have a quick qu- Can you say the name of the book again, Grant? It's uh, Hard to Handle the Life and Death of the Black Crows, a memoir. And if you haven't picked up on this already, it's uh, Steve Gorman, uh, founding member, drummer from the Black Crows. You're no longer in the band. That that should be uh, that should be said out loud. Um, <laughs> since the book has come out, Steve, have you been in contact with anybody from the Black Crows? I've been in contact with pretty much everybody not named Robinson. <laughs> so, you know, um, you know, uh, everybody that was ever in the band, and that's an embarrassingly long list of people, all great players, but a silly amount of people came through the revolving door there uh, towards the second half of the band. Yeah. And then, um, you know, crew members, Everybody from management, record company, basically, you know, there's a whole lot of people in the Black Crows universe, as you might expect. And I've heard from just about everybody. I've heard from everyone in the book and from dozens of people who weren't named in the book, but who played a big part of things. So to answer your question, yeah, only two people have not gotten in touch. And that's very, uh, that's, that's as expected. Yeah, yeah. At what point, Steve, did you realize... And I, no judgment here, because I think a lot of times you get yourself into a situation, things are good, and you 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 maybe talk yourself into the idea that that things are better than they might be. But was there a point where you were like, "Oh Jesus, this is this is really this is really dysfunctional"? Was there was there a uh, moment that, that was? Yeah, the the first time that occurred to me was. Um, in 1987, so you know, well before <laughs> anything, you know, I, I, I moved to Atlanta to start a band with friends and within a few months I had quit that band and started with the Robinson brothers. And within a few months of that decision, I was going, I might have made a very big mistake here. <laughs> um, but to your point too, there was always this chemistry. There was always a vibe that we shared where, despite the obvious day-to-day drama and stresses, the overview was always, no, this is the right place for me. And then, you know, then, then we added a few members, get a producer, make a record. Our lives all changed in 1990 with Shake Your Money Maker. But there was a time that first summer we were out opening for Aerosmith, which was our first big tour in arenas. And Johnny Colt, the original bassist, and I, on a day off in Columbus, Ohio, sitting in a hot tub at a Holiday Inn, went, look at this is going to all blow apart, isn't it? You know, we were like, yeah, yeah, it sure is. I mean, it was just always a part of the fabric of the band, if you will. It was and just fragile. I talk, I, I talk in the book a lot about the, the, the constant checking in with myself. Is this still worth it? Is this crazy? Yeah. And, and here's something that I know is a fact despite what anyone else says, every single member of the band lived that same life where every couple of days you found yourself staring in the mirror going, well, what am I doing here? And that was everyone in the band. So that was not unique to my experience at all. You think that we, we didn't make things, we never made things easy on ourselves. And in fact, we made them a lot harder than they needed to be at all times. Some people are just wired that way, right? Like, it's just they wake up every morning and they're either angry or they're going to make their lives difficult and there's you you can't change yep. that right like no it's really it's really true i mean i i don't you know i say towards the end of the book i used to call chris names i don't do that anymore i mean i haven't for a long time he's not waking up and going how can i ruin everyone's day that's not a conscious thought um even though sometimes it seems like that can be the case but 
you know, I was just as guilty as anyone of losing perspective really quickly. When the first record came out, we got onto a bus for 20 months and didn't look back. Wow. And at the end of that 20 months, you know, I, I remember and can still feel what it felt like the day after the Shake Your Money Maker tour ended. We flew home from England, and I woke up in my new apartment the next day and felt completely lost and bewildered. Mm-hmm. I had no idea what to do. Like, I had completely given my life over to being on the road and constantly looking to the next thing. And all I wanted was a break. And the day I got it, I was lost. And just, you know, it's like the game's over at that point. And I was, quote, unquote, the rational one. You know what I mean? Like, <laughs> you know, people were like, you know, and I used to say, if I'm the one leading the charge of sensible thought, we're in trouble, fellas. <laughs> yeah. You know, well, I'm not feeling too. I'm not feeling like I got all my ducks lined up right now. You know, when you live in a dysfunctional sort of situation, everybody sort of, whether you want to or not, you're forced into your different roles, right? So obviously, hundred um, percent. Yeah, 100%. I mean, you must have had some 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 level of codependency in that relationship, and 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 then oh, yeah. it, it I has. Mean, I, I, I talk and I talk about that in the book. That was a huge turning point for me was when our manager said, there's a book you need to get. And it was about codependency. And I read it and was like, oh, my God. (laughs) That's me. I'm as sick as anybody else, you know. Um, You know, it's the context of my book is my life in a rock and roll band. But honestly, it's, it's a story about codependency and addiction and loyalty and betrayal and friendship and brotherhood and success and failure. It's a story about a family. You know, we're a family. And... I think that there's a lot of, you know, this is a book that a lot of people who aren't necessarily Black Crows fans can really relate to because of, and the things you just said, when you're dealing, if you put an addict in a room, the first guy that turns up is going to be a codependent. That's just how life works. Yeah. And anybody who's got a family, if you have a family member with addiction, you circle the wagons, you keep a lot of secrets. And again, like you said, you don't even know you're doing it. You don't mean to, Mm -hmm. you don't decide that we're going to have a, a culture of secrecy here. But the Black Crows were an extreme example of all of those things. And then along the way, pretty damn good rock and roll band. Yeah, you know what? I want to make sure we say that out loud because I, man, I I, I love the Black Crows. I still love the Black Crows. And even yeah, though we heard stories, like in the, in the media, right? I've been doing this longer than I want to admit, but uh, we heard stories about how crazy your guys' situation was. It's, the odd thing leaked, but everyone just went, oh, okay, well, they're the new kinks. So, but they keep putting right. out great songs. And if they come to town, man, yeah. I'm going to go, right? Like, so it, it's, um, it, that dysfunction worked its way into the music and, and on stage and what you guys were able to create. Well, no doubt about it. I mean, I think you get into trouble when you start buying in that that's a necessity, you know, that that's like an important part of the fuel is this stuff. That That's when you get yourself in trouble. Yeah. Um, and we certainly did that. You know, there's everything in life you got to evolve. Whatever you thought your life was going to be once you got on the air, you get behind the mic you do it for a few years and then you're like, Oh, I, I, okay. I see this very differently now. And there's different things at play. There's different stakes. There's different elements that I need to respect and at least acknowledge if I want this to continue. Mm -hmm. And the band had a really hard time doing that. You know, it was just too, there weren't a lot of, uh, there was not a lot of room for personal growth and evolution. And, and, you know, again, you establish a culture early on. And unfortunately we did so, as very young guys, um, you know, early twenties. And it's really hard to break those things out, especially when everybody's telling you how great you are all the time. Yeah. Uh, you've had time to sit on it now. It's, it's, it's out there by the way, full disclosure, I, I've been meaning to read this book, but I don't read like I used to. So I haven't gotten to it yet. Um, and I, I, you know, I'll give you, I'll tell you something right now. I I've cornered the market on, man, I don't read books, but I like this one. I get that <laughs> yeah. A lot. So yeah. You know what? I, I, I'm still, I'm hopeful that the actual readers of the world will pick it up too. But right now the non-readers are floating my sails. You know what I'm saying? I was, well, I was reading the, uh, the Rolling Stone had an article about your book and just, they kind of touched on some of the stories in it. And I'm like, all right, I need to read this. No, everybody needs to read yeah, this that one, book. The, the Liam Gallagher stories and the Led Zeppelin stories. It's, it's awesome. Yeah. And I, I actually was going to, uh, try to 
do that this weekend, but there was a lot of sports on TV this weekend, Steve. So I got drunk and watched sports this weekend instead of read a bit of your book, but um, that's not an excuse. I, I, uh, we, we've all been there more yeah. times than we care to admit. Yeah, so, yeah. No sweat. Um, so you've had a chance to, let's mention the book one more time so people can get, go grab this thing online or do whatever they do with books now. Yeah, so it is called Hard to Handle, The Life and Death of the Black Crows, a memoir. By the way, Hard to Handle, an Otis Redding cover. I'd like to point that out. (laughs) Um, I have a question about regret. And is there anything in the book, Steve, after the fact now that you, 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 you sort of look back and go, ah, shit, I shouldn't have put that in there. Oh no, no, not okay. at all. You mean in the book? Not, not at all. Okay, good, um, good. And I, you know, I had a year, almost a year from when I turned in. I wrote nine hundred pages, and the book is about three fifty. So wow. <laughs> I spent a lot of time bringing that thing down to size. Um, you know, it wasn't like a, it wasn't something that was just turned in with a ghostwriter really fast. I mean, I spent, you know, a good year and a half on this thing, all told. So, you know, it's. Um, it's uh, to answer your question. No, I gave myself plenty of time to make sure of that because you get you get one shot to tell your story, and you can always add to it, but you can never remove something from it. So I made real sure that that I wouldn't want to. You have a bit of a broadcasting background, um, which I, I, I find interesting about your. Where are you at right now? You're on you're on Westwood, right? Because you were on you were on. Yeah, West, yep, Westwood one. I have a I have a. Uh, a classic rock show called Steve Gorman Rocks. It's at night across the U.S. Okay. Um, uh, Westwood One Cumulus. Do you miss the sports coverage? No, I got so sick of it, man. I did. You know, <laughs> sports talk was really fun, but I was always, well, you know, I started a sports talk show in Nashville, Tennessee, where I live, and the whole construct was musicians talking sports. Yeah. So you know, and 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 to my great surprise, it kept on working. And then one day I'm on, you know, a national network going, "Oh, this is weird." I mean, it was great, <laughs> but, um, but but at a certain point, you know, people were suggesting people who were in charge of my career and the network were going, "We need you to straighten it out and be more like a regular sports show." And that was never my goal in the first place. I I wanted to do something unique. You know, my idea of good sports talk is. When I hear myself droning on and I'm bored with my own voice, I'll just go sit down and start playing drums, and, uh, <laughs> and, let, and let my co let my co-host finish the point I was trying to make, you know, and and that worked. It was a lot of fun, but you know, honestly, it just ran its course. I found myself like the fifth going into the fifth year on on Fox Sports. I was like, another NFL season. It's the same storylines. It just it just didn't work for me. I just ran out of ways to spin the same narrative, yeah. or, you know, to rework the same talking points. And I just felt like I really didn't think about it. I just felt like, Oh, this is done. I think I'm ready for something else now. And, uh, and I did have a book deadline looming. So I was like, I think I'm going to stop this and finish this book. Um, it's interesting. You mentioned the drumming thing. You're, you're still doing that. You're in a band called, and I would actually encourage people to look this up. If you get a chance, trigger hippie, which I think is a brilliant name, by the way. Um, and I, I actually, I had not listened to that band until, um, yesterday, actually, when I was contemplating what we were going to talk about on, uh, on this little chat. And so I had it on in the background. That's it. That's a great little project, man. That you must be proud of that. I'm very proud of it. Um, we put a record out in October called full circle and then some, and I, you know, much like with the book, I mean, it, it took a long time, uh, because. You know, it's funny, the older I've gotten, I've gotten way more patient, which is counterintuitive almost, but it makes perfect sense. But <laughs> there's a lot of false starts in any career early on. One of the problems with the Black Crows was we, we, we were doing great when we were all on the same page. And that, you know, that was how it went for two album cycles. And then as soon as there was a split and different visions and, and no compromise made within the band, you know, it's real obvious. You can chart the Black Crows. It's interesting. When we were at our best and at our most cohesive, commercial success chased us. And when we splintered internally, the audience went away too. And mm. and it was a pretty simple fix to me that was never we were never able to make in the band. A lot of moving in one direction before everybody was on board. And then a lot of, well, we got to start over. Let's change course. And when you're doing that in any kind of project, you're you're dead and you don't know it. And so... Trigger Hippie has been a very slow-moving, 
you know, uh, a band over years because I just, if I've learned one thing, it's, it's way better to go somewhere together really slowly than to get a burst of speed and then have to figure it out as you go. Yeah. Well, I would encourage people to look into it, especially if you've got a bit of a, um, a hankering for R&B because it's, it's got a bit of an R&B feel, feel to it. Okay, final question here, Steve. Um, yes, sir. You, you covered for the, on the drums for a band out of the U.K., which I've always been surprised did not do better in North America. They had a couple of sort of hits here, but nothing really. They didn't really... They didn't really grab a toehold here, but they're huge in the UK. The Stereophonics. Now, I right. had a chance one night to drink with them, and um, yeah, it was uh, good luck. Yeah, no kidding. They re- they they were they surprised the hell out of me. Anyway, who partied harder, the Black Crows or the Stereophonics? Oh, the Black Crows, and it's not even a close debate. <laughs> now the Stereophonics. Now the Stereophonics crew. That's a whole other world. You know, tell you. Kelly and Richard, really, they, those guys have very sensible heads on their shoulders. Um, uh, but as far, but if you want to sit down and go pound for pound, ounce to ounce of alcohol, no, yeah, you don't want to get in a room with a bunch of Welsh guys. I can no. tell you that. That was a uh, that was an education. As I said, touring the world, seeing the sights, one Irish pub at a time. <laughs> <laughs> awesome, Steve. I really uh, appreciate we, this, man. This this is this has been awesome. You had one last thing you want to say. Oh, I was just going to say, I, I, those guys, we met in 1999 and we really hit it off immediately, you know, me and the, and those boys. And when that whole thing went down in 03, where they asked me to fill in for a show and then it was two shows and then it was a week. And then it was like, Oh, just do the whole tour. It was, it was, that really educated me a lot on how crazy the black crows were because getting on the road and touring, but not in the black crows. I was like, Oh, this is actually fun. (laughs) You You get to go out and, have a great time and it's okay to laugh on stage and we're entertaining and people are loving it and it's okay to thank them for that. Hey, this is great. You know, it was a real, it was a real eye opening thing to go do that without any of the inherent pressures of being in the band. You know what I mean? So yeah, yeah. Um, I, I owe those guys a lot. I'm, I'm, I'm still close with them and I think the world of them, I think they're a great band. I really appreciate your time today, man. I, I, I have a feeling we could talk to you for like three days straight. So this, well, you this, know, if you find yourself in Nashville, you know, let me know, man. I'll right. show you the sites. All right, we'll come down. We'll do, we'll do some barbecue. Careful, we'll actually show up. Yeah, <laughs> you don't know us. <laughs> I, I, I I've spent enough time in Western Canada. I have a sensibility of what's going on here. I'm, I'm feeling confident. Uh, I, feel, I feel like I can I can I can show you a good time. All right. All right. Yeah. Listen, and uh, we'll make sure that uh, all three of us are going to read that damn book. Yep. We promise. Okay. If you, listen, and if you can't find the time, just get the audio book. I read it. It's you know, it's a little easier sometimes. I got to start doing that because I listen to podcasts all the time. True. Why don't I just get the damn books on audio? Yeah. Get did you book. look? Just, did you do the just, narration? Get, get it. Yeah, it's me. Get of course you the, did. Yeah. Go, go. Just set your uh, you know set the GPS for Swift Current. Take a day <laughs> trip. You know, you'll be in good shape. There you go. <laughs> all right, my friend. It was uh, great chatting with you. Cheers, fellas. Thanks. All right. Take care, man. See ya. The Locker Room. Brought to you by Always Plumbing and Heating. Weekday mornings on 95.7 Cruise FM.